This is the Horse Radio Network. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here is your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I'm Coach Jen from Ocala, Florida. And I'm Mary Kitzmiller from Kemp, Texas. And you are listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for September 8th, episode 3015. Good morning, Horse World. What is your favorite day of the week? Never stop learning, never stop understanding. It's more in depth than just riding a horse. Exciting, knowing that for the rest of my life I could work on this and, and I'll never stop learning. Greetings, everyone. On this show, we're going to find out where in the world is Mary Kitzmiller. We're going to chat about a training tip that compliments of one of our listeners, and there's going to be a new Mustang in Mary's life. Stay tuned. Welcome back, Mary Kitzmiller. Glad to be back. Yay. Before we got started this afternoon or this morning doing our recording, I was going to congratulate you because, of course, I'm following your adventures on your Facebook page. You got there with no drama, no flat tires, no hurt horses, no accidents, no traffic tie-ups. And you were so excited for you because you got to the makeover with no drama, but that the drama stayed home. <laughs> yes. Um, so when we were planning, like uh, our family was planning the next few months of, oh, you're going to be here. I'm going here. We're doing this. We kind of forgot that we had. So my stepdad and brother are visiting family up in Ohio. And I am doing um, stuff at the Extreme Mustang Makeover this week. And my mom was going to come with me. And then they're like, we're, we were like, wait a minute. Who is watching the ranch? So, unfortunately, she had to stay home. And she is uh, watching her dogs. And she's watching my dogs. And she's feeding my cats. And she's feeding the ranch. And plus, our shop has a lot of orders. So, she's fulfilling orders. So, um, in the midst of all that, someone um, left the water running all night. And, uh, yeah, she's. Uh, I think she's a little stressed with the... Uh, Becoming ranch manager overnight all by herself um, while I'm enjoying my time in Fort Worth. <laughs> oh, I, I think I think Mary Kitzler's mom deserves this. <laughs> yeah, she uh, she needs a medal for for uh, watching the ranch this weekend because it's a big job. Yay, moms. Yay. Oh, <laughs> hey moms. Well, you mentioned extreme Mustang makeover. I have never had to, I've never had the opportunity to go to an extreme Mustang makeover and they're becoming more and more and more popular every year. And I always associated the extreme Mustang makeover with the Mustangs who are being newly trained. So first I'm going to ask are extreme Mustang makeovers, are the competitors always hor horses that are being trained or are there classes in these competitions for Mustangs that have had experience in life and do other things? So it's a little bit of both and it depends on the individual makeover. But this year for Fort Worth, um, we have the traditional makeover, which is these trainers um, got these horses three or four months ago completely wild and so they met their horse for the first time a few months ago and they've been working their butts off all summer and this is the culmination they come to fort worth from all over the map and show what their horse can do and the whole purpose of it is to not only show the public look these horses are amazing they can jump they can work cattle they can you know they can get in the trailer they're you know they're ready for a new home um so it's to show off what a Mustang can do, but also the horses that are in this traditional style makeover are getting um, auctioned at the end to approved adopters. So if you are in the Fort Worth area and you think you might be in the market for a new horse, um, come on down and check out what um, what we've got. The trainers have done an amazing job. 
And on the on the other side of the uh, in the, one of the other barns at Fort Worth, we have what's called a Mustang Open Show. So if you already have a Mustang and you want to show off your horse against other Mustangs, there are open classes, and I they have a uh, walk trot, walk trot canter. You can show in hand. Um, you can do any discipline you want. Um, so that is also going on this weekend as well. And the reason I'm actually here is because uh, Remington is the new ambassador for the America's Horse Program. So we're here this week and we're going to be carrying the flag at the opening ceremonies for the freestyle on Saturday night. And then we're doing a training demo um, 9 a.m. on Saturday over in the John Justin Arena. How fun is that? Is are and you might not know this, but are there a lot of the makeovers that include classes for the permanently homed people that just own a Mustang and want to show it in a Mustang class? Do you, are, do you see that a lot or are they in the minority? It's starting to become a thing. Um, okay. I don't there. There are open shows on the schedule on the Mustang makeover website. I can't tell you off the top of my head if there's going to be another one this year. But it is starting to become more prevalent, and um, the prizes are really good. It's really fun. Um, a little bit less pressure because you're bringing your own horse. That's you know you. It's not a you don't have to train a whole new horse to do it. Right, right. Um, well, that makes sense for somebody. Somebody goes out, they go to a makeover, they get a Mustang that's already been started, or they get a Mustang and start it for themselves, but don't compete. But it's really cool because there's a reason all these different breeds have shows for their own breeds because people enjoy that process and that <clears throat> excuse me that feeling of community you have something in common with all those other horses i think it's really cool that the blm mustangs have the opportunity to create that same thing you can go to a show and compete among other mustangs in lots of different disciplines because when you think about it the mustang is sort of the ultimate multitasker in that they've never been bred by humans to be good at one particular thing quarter horses early on tended to be bred towards ranch work and then even more so you have ranch bred and you have halter bred and you have pleasure bred mustangs are from my point of view all created equal in that respect yeah, and what I tell people about Mustangs, you know, some people who aren't very familiar with them are like, oh, I want a Mustang, but they're too small, or I want a Mustang, but this and that, or and they give me some sort of trait that they think all Mustangs have, and I say, whatever you want in a horse, if you like, you know, a kind of Spanishy classical dressage type horse, or you want a little quarter horse type horse for cutting, or you want a horse for endurance, or you want something that just wants to go trail riding every month or two, um, you can find a Mustang that fits that bill. There's so many diverse Mustangs all across the range. Um, and you can find a Mustang that matches what you're looking for in a horse. You have to do a little research and shop around and, and looking, but I've seen all kinds. And I was, uh, I was really surprised. I saw somebody post the other day on one of my Facebook feeds. <clears throat> They have a Mustang that they've started already, and I don't even remember what discipline they were going towards, but it was 16 hands. I didn't know they made them that big. Mm -hmm. They do. <laughs> yeah. I've got a 15-3 guy at home, and he is he's not very tall, but I mean, you know, 15-3 is pretty tall, but he's a beast. He looks like a half-draft horse. He looks like a war horse. He's so cool. Wow. Um, wow. Isn't and then I also have one in my pasture that looks like a hackney pony. He is total horse proportions, but he's like 11 hands. Wow. Um, yeah, he doesn't quite move like a hackney, but he's so adorable. And his particular herd, they were kind of isolated from a lot of the other herds. So they that when that happens, the horses tend to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And he's so cute. Isn't that funny? The only Mustang I ever worked with personally now was he was 12 hands ish uh, and he had already been started and properly trained before I ever met him. Uh, he was finding his, his second home because the children all grew out of him, but he was also, he was a lot around 12 hands, but very hackney ish in that he didn't have the big body, short legs you associate with ponies. Right. Yeah. Uh, he was relatively refined. And also he had a very, I would call it, 
primitive gait. His trot had that short step with not a lot of elevation Mm -hmm. that you associate with maybe a Przewalski's horse or something, which was perfect for little kids because it didn't have any bounce. Exactly. (laughs) The kids could hold on really, really well, and they just fly around with him. He's a great little (laughs) all-around pony, kid pony. And uh, that's interesting that there, there's so much variety. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to the extreme Mustang makeover that you're at this weekend. And you said it's in Fort Worth. Is that right? Mm-hmm. In Fort Worth. Now, how long does it take you to get to Fort Worth from where you're at in Kemp? Uh, I'm about an hour and a half southeast. So not Oh, my gosh. Bad. That's just like a hop, skip, and a jump for you guys. Yeah, for Texas, that's like a trip to the store. Yeah, that's going to be the gas station for you guys. How, about how many competitors are going are at this one? I want to say there were like 90 trainers, which wow. is great. Yeah, because there's youth um, there's youth division as well, and that is all in hand. And these kids, I tell you what, they are troopers because they are training yearlings and they have put the work in and they have these, the youth kids always have the best freestyles with all the props and yeah, costumes. Yeah. And tr- well, yeah. Let's stop here. Cause a lot of, and I made this assumption too. The youth class, they do in hands. Oh, they make it too easy for the youth. A lot of these youth could do the under saddle part. Think about this youth. So they have full-time school as well. Mm-hmm. They have to do Mustang, which has never been handled in its life. Mm-hmm. It's a freaking yearling. I've worked with a lot of yearlings. Yearlings mm-hmm. are bonkers. <laughs> well, and yeah. And and the thing that I see every makeover um, is I know that these kids have put in long days and they come up with this really great freestyle. But and when, you know, you see it at the show, one or two yearlings is always like, I remember nothing and yes. nope, I don't know how to get on a pedestal. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this jump. And these kids talk about character building. They just keep showing. They act like everything's going according to plan. And um, when you start seeing some of these youth trainers get into the, they they hit 18 and they're eligible for the open and the riding, they kick all the adults butts because they have been around the block with these yearlings and they it really makes them really well-rounded and patient and very good trainers and there there's a couple people here this weekend who've only shown in youth and this is their first adult makeover and their horses look incredible they're very good trainers isn't that interesting so yes a, a character building you learn to deal with the the pressure, the success, the highs, the lows, the disappointments, all those things that it come with going to what is really a big event. It is. Early on. Isn't that cool? And are there, I get, I don't know, rules for the makeovers for the youth as well as the adult divisions? Are there restrictions on, I'm going to use my finger quotes because there's really no way to track it, who trains the horse? You know, there is not. Um, Now, I haven't done a makeover for a few years, but I could, if I wanted to, um, take my horse and pay a trainer and they could do all the work and I could come and show the horse. That is totally allowed. And the, the pros to that is... I never feel like if I have a horse that, man, this horse is stumping me and I, man, I'm not sure I want to get in the saddle. I have the option to go get help from someone and it's made the community very, um, open and we've we I've done events before where we all took our horses to a one ranch and we're all helping each other you know we're all getting on oh, each other's neat. horses yeah you know if we've got a horse with a particular challenge so it allows for that and no trainer that I know of has been like well I'm not going to do the work I'm just going to do the showing but yeah there is well, a challenge to that because you yeah. really have to create to do well you have to create the bond with yes. that horse so it's, it's yes almost I think a it's a, a little different than a, a domesticated horse it's, yeah because so, these, the the human that's showing them at the competition that's such a short period of time and you literally have to develop that relationship and oftentimes by the time they get to that first competition it's very much a case of okay i'm cool with humans and i'm cool with all the human things that are happening but only with that human 
<laughs> One of the most interesting phenomenons I've seen have been with people who get like a really, really challenging Mustang. And I've had it happen to me before. One of my first Mustangs was like, I don't even know if I can get him inside an arena because it was a year. There was a huge uh, what's it called? A breakout of some disease, e EVH1, EHV1, whatever that virus was. Mm -hmm. And everything was shut down. There were no shows and things to haul to. So I didn't get to haul him out hardly anywhere. And I remember thinking, oh my, and he was a very sensitive and nervous animal. And I thought, I don't know if I can get him in the building. And you kind of are going to this makeover thinking, gosh, I just hope that it all stays together. And this horse was so hard. And when you get to the makeover, the horse kind of looks around and then looks at you and they're like, you're the only person that's familiar here. So I'm going to do what you want me to do. And these horses just step up and show like they're an old pro. So it's really interesting how that happens. And I think it starts from, you know, that horse is like, well, we're in this together now. And so, yeah, creating that bond is so important. How cool is that? So next step, you arrive at the Fort Worth competition. For those of us, or particularly if we are East Coasters, describe the facility where that's at. We just got back from Fort Worth, and boy, what a town. Oh, I love Fort Worth. It's such a Texas town, um, and the facility is really nice. There's several arenas. There's two coliseums, and it's got kind of a, uh, what's the style of architecture, Um the Art Deco. It's kind of like Art Deco. Yes, yeah, I like definitely it's agree. Had a it's great gap. Beautiful. Theme. Yeah. Um, so it's a really beautiful facility, and lots of huge of equine events are there every year. Um, so it really just feels, you know, it feels like a big event. And, and it's smack in the middle of the city. It is. It is. The difference, you know, people think of the DFW, you know, Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, these cities are relatively close to each other, but the difference between Dallas and Fort Worth is immense. Fort Worth is Texas and you've got the stockyards right around the corner, which is a great place to go. If you've never been to Texas before, they run longhorn cattle through the streets, lots of cool shopping and Western experiences. And so the, the Mustang makeover facility, the Will Rogers is just a few miles away. And it's really fun and there's great places to eat and the atmosphere, it's it's my favorite place to show. I really, I love it there. It's a, from my point of view, it's one of the most spectator friendly venues that I've been to because so often in the United States, horseshoe, horseshoe venues in this day and age are in either small towns or in very sparsely populated areas because that's where the land is affordable. Mm -hmm. The days of Madison Square Garden and Washington International are kind of gone, to, hopefully temporarily. And it's really neat that this particular facility is in a really fascinating, fun, high energy town. So that to go and watch, it's more than just the horse show. The whole family can go there, find cool things to do. Or if you're completely just horse crazy, there's plenty for that too which I think is really neat. I was very pleased with having just been there for the first time a few weeks ago. I said, this is a really cool little town. The whole place smells a little bit like cow poop. It does. <laughs> it does. Which is a cool yeah, very that. nostalgic feeling. <laughs> very and Western. Cool that. So the competition, it, the competition itself goes over how many days? So they actually are showing right now. And so it, this today's the first day of competition. They're doing the handling and conditioning class, which is an in-hand class. And the cl that class is really to show that this horse has been well cared for because, you know, uh, the condition, they, they judge the animal on its condition, you know, shiny coat and good weight, and all that kind of stuff. And they do, um, a pattern where they will, the trainer will turn the horse loose in a round pen and then they have to go recatch the horse. And there, there'll be elements of the pattern like brushing the horse and picking up the horse's feet. And it always culminates in you have to load the horse in a trailer in the arena. And 
it's a great class because it's, you know, it shows you have to have kept up on your basic groundwork and you're showing the public, this is how manageable this horse is. And, um, and it's a tough class because a trailer just in your parking lot versus a trailer in a big scary arena are two different things for a horse. Very different. Very different and, uh, indeed. <laughs> yeah. So that's going on right now this now morning. Does, does everybody have to do that class or is that just for the youth? Youth and adults. So okay. even though the cool. adults are riding in the majority of their classes, this is an in-hand class. And um, yeah, like I said, you know, for people that are wanting to adopt a Mustang this weekend, this is a great way to see how does this horse, if he's turned loose, can he be caught again? How, can you pick up his feet easily? Can I get him in the trailer when I buy him to go home? Um, and, and, you know, then they are judging like, how well is this horse taken care of? Is he skin and bones? Is he, um, you know, does he look healthy and fat and, and well cared for? So it's a really important class. Um, and then this evening it, for the adults is the Mustang maneuvers class. So that'll be a pattern class and it's under saddle and, it, you know, it'll have elements like, um, moving your horse's shoulder or side passing or, you know, gate changes and all of that kind of stuff. So the class, and then are the scores cumulative in each class or is each class judged and pinned individually? So they are judged and pinned individually, but the scores, um, so that this will, so today's handling and conditioning, they've got the maneuvers tomorrow will be a trail class. So they will place all of those classes, but then those scores are all going to be combined to determine who makes the finals on Saturday, which will be only 10 people out of all the trainers that show up. Wow. Top, so that, that kind of gives a whole new meeting to top 10 out of that number of competitors. Yes. It, and it is very nerve wracking. And the first <laughs> years that they did the makeover, because n there wasn't any bar set and yeah. no one had done this before. And so if your horse was reasonably broke, you were in and it has gotten so competitive. Um, I have done makeovers where I was in the top five and two of my classes and I made one mistake in the third class and I was out. I couldn't show in the finals. And so it is very nerve wracking and it's like, you know, fractions of a point that can get you knocked out of that top 10 spot. Wow. That's pretty cool. So when, when is Remy's first performance? So we will be doing a demo. Um, we'll be showing in some of the open classes for fun, but our, you know, official capacity thing that we're doing uh, is 9 a.m. at the John Justin Arena. And we're doing a training demo um, where it'll be me and him and I'll just show different things that I've done with him and, um, you know, things like how to establish a connection with your horse. Um, and then that night we'll be carrying the flag for the ceremony. Oh, boy. Yay. yay. Oh, and for people who want to follow along on you and Remy's adventures at Fort Worth and elsewhere, uh, what, where's the best social media to find you? Uh, Mary Kitts Miller Horsemanship. I'll be throwing some updates up there, and that is on Facebook. Cool. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and listen to some Templeton Thompson because we can. And when we come back, we are going to have Mary's monthly training tip. <laughs> Guessing wasn't such a perfect landing Yeah, I'm still alive, not sure how I survived It was a hell of a ride till it ended I guess that's what you get when you leave You don't always end up on your feet Oh, there's easier ways I could go Every up, every down, every snap. 
single go round Every fall I have found makes me stronger So I'll knock all the dust off and then I'll get back in the sand on again Oh, there's easy ways I could go Oh, but deep down inside of me I know I really have something to show When I get that And of course, you can find all of Templeton Thompson's music at templetonthompson.com. She is also on most of the streaming services. We'd like to go to templetonthompson.com better because then any funds that are spent, she gets all of them. Doesn't have to share. We love that. So one of our favorite parts of the show each month is Mary Kitts Miller's training tip. And to submit your question to be a training tip on the show, you need to be a patron need to go to horsesinthemorning.com and find the Become an Auditor banner and click on that. You can join the fun. And who submitted a question this month and what is it? So I actually borrowed this from one of our auditors. We uh, we were having a little private message conversation about Mustangs because she has a, a Mustang that she's working with. Um, and it's Carly. And she doesn't even, even know I'm using her question, but I'm going to use it anyway because I she'll know be she'll surprised be surprised and pleased when she hears this. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so and I, I get this question often um, about, you know, preparing a young horse to accept a rider. And one thing that I realized that I, I just kind of forget that is not common knowledge is one of the methods that I use on every horse is not very widely known by many. And it is such a great exercise. So I thought I would talk about it a little bit. Um, and it is known as either the Jeffrey method or the human curry comb. Human curry comb. Okay. Human I can't curry wait to hear about comb. this. <laughs> yes. Um, because that is what you essentially become is a human curry comb. So there are lots of ways to get a young horse ready for the rider. And you know, one of the most important things I think everyone agrees on is they need to accept the weight of the rider. Um, but the the human curry comb, what sets it apart is like how intense it is and how like close body contact with the horse, it creates this effect in the horse. It's relaxing and it, you can take a completely wild horse and within 30 minutes you're laying on their back. And despite how kind of crazy that might sound, it's very, it's relatively safe. I mean, anytime you're working with a young horse, there are risks involved. But knock on wood, I've I've never had it go wrong. Knock on wood, you know, like I said, never say never. But <laughs> um, and this was taught to me by um, a trainer I worked for many years ago. And the story that he told uh, the the man who invented it is an Australian trainer known as Kel Jeffrey, and I don't know all the exact details. So I may get some of these facts wrong, but um, 
I believe he was a trainer kind of like turn of the, you know, early 1900s era, maybe a little later, who uh, who created this method. And I've seen other interpretations of it as well. And the story that I was told, like I said, this is totally an anecdote. I don't know exactly how it's historically accurate it is, but he um, was didn't start out being a horse expert. And he had some, I think he had some sort of sickness. I don't know if it was cancer, or tuberculosis or something in that ilk and was told you need to go out to the country, the country air is going to do you well. And he went to a relative's cattle station out in the middle of nowhere, Australia. And the story goes, as it was told to me, um, was, you know, he would be sitting out on the, on the porch of this ranch and would watch all the, all the ringers, all the stockmen out there taking um, horses out for the day to do all the, all the day work that they had to do. And they'd always leave this one mare in the pen and never used her. And he asked like, why aren't you using that one mare? And they said, Oh, she's an outlaw. You know, we can't ride her, yada, yada, yada. And so he thought, hmm, okay. So while everyone was gone for the day, he went out there and would work with this mare. And as I understand it, the only tools he had, he had like a, a tin barrel and a rope and a stick with a hook at the end of it. And he would go out and just work with this mare. And uh, one day when they came home from working cattle, uh, they saw this guy, Kel Jeffrey, riding this horse around bareback. And she's as gentle as a lamb. And they're like, what? How did you do that? And so he showed them, and it was almost kind of unbelievable. So they got out another horse. They're like, do it on this one. And he repeated the results again and again. And so he began sharing this method. And he's he also has come up with other uh, really interesting training practices that I still use starting my Mustangs. Um, but what this method is, is... When you're preparing to get on your horse, uh, you want some basic groundwork with the horse, you know, some basic control of their feet so that if they get scared and they want to move, you can direct where they move their feet in a safe way. So I want to make sure when I'm doing this with my colt that um, I can tip their nose toward me and then I can move their hind end away from me. That's very important. So I have some reasonable control of their feet on the ground and I will do some basic desensitizing with them before I go in myself. So like I'll make sure I can, you know, touch them everywhere and I can, um, I can, I'll throw ropes at them, things like that. So that it's not a total surprise when I start doing this method. Um, but when I start, I will stand at the colt's shoulders. They'll have, I'll keep the lead rope loose because I don't want them to feel like I'm trapping them into staying still, but you also want to keep your wits about you and not just have like 10 feet of rope, you know, hanging in your hand. Cause if they get scared and jump forward, you need to be able to control what happens. So, you know, a relatively loose rope, but still short enough to manage their feet if they need to move. And I start by rubbing the horse all over with two hands. And how the way this method works, you need to be vigorous in it. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. You don't want to be painful with how you're petting them. But you don't want to be tickling them either. So I rub them with my hands like I'm trying to curry the hair off, basically. And um, then what I start to do is I'll start to lean on the horse. So I kind of lean just behind their wither. I'll start to lean on the horse as I'm rubbing them. The other thing that you need to make sure you're doing is never stop moving. The rhythm of this method is what makes it work. So if I lean on my horse and I go completely still, the horse is going to be like, wait, what are you up to? So I keep, I lean on the horse and I'm rubbing the whole time. And every time I get a little further with what I'm doing, I'm going to stop and back away. So you're going to get in there, rub, 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 and then release. Back away, let them process what happens. And you're going to repeat that over and over and over. And as I'm leaning on that horse, and you want to really lean on them. What I was told is by the end of this method, if your shirt and you know your outfit isn't completely covered in horse hair, you're not doing it right. <laughs> So you are curry. Yeah, you're, you're human curry gum. Um, so I'll make sure you know I can rub the horse all over his neck and all over his belly and run my hands over his hip and on the other side of his barrel and all of this. And if, if at any 
stage in the game, he says, oh, this feels uncomfortable. I'd like to move. I allow him to move. I don't stop rubbing with my hands. Um, but I will also tip that horse's nose toward me so that when he moves, he's going to move in a small circle yielding his hind quarters. And we'll go round and round and round as many little circles as he wants to do. And then when he stops and commits to stopping and relaxing, then I stop rubbing. So he will learn that the answer is when you feel something that you're not really sure about, it's okay to move. And that thing will go away when you stop and relax. So in the beginning, the horse really just learns to kind of put up with it. Like, I know that I need to just stop and stand still. I think that's a really interesting and important point to make Mm -hmm. that let them move and teach them early on that it's okay to move, but let's, let's have a compromise here and move, but move in this direction or in this fashion. You're only putting one criteria on there, move. And for the horse's point of view, the most important part is that he moves and hopefully you haven't pushed him so far over threshold that he needs, feels the necessity to move and move very far away. He just needs to move so he can get that out of his system. Yes. It's very important to say, you know, we're moving. It's okay. We can move. We can move. We can move. And then I think for a lot of people, they feel like you're rubbing, you're touching, you're rubbing, you're touching, you're letting them move. And then you stop when they stop and be still. They think they're rewarding the horse moving. So I think to to talk about a little bit about that timing, horse is moving, you're rubbing, horse is moving, you're rubbing. And he stops, and it's really not a stop, it's a pause, and you st- and you release the pressure by no longer touching the horse. If you don't get that timing right, what he does do is go, oh, look, I moved away, you stopped. You have to be able to recognize when they stopped, and uh, you used a great word there, they committed to being still. Mm-hmm. That's where the reward comes. And that's where timing is essential because if you get that wrong, you're literally rewarding the wrong behavior. It's not that the horse got the wrong answer. The horse did anything wrong. Your timing was off. Yes. And if that happens and it's bound to happen, you're going to go, oh, I released a little too soon. The more that you repeat getting it right, the more you kind of erase the one mistake you made. So, you know, if it happens, just keep going and, you know, try to get it better the next time and you'll be okay. You won't have any, you won't have committed this huge mistake, but yes, timing is very important and allowing the movement is uh, in doing it in a certain way as in yield your hindquarters away from me. Keep your nose uh, pointed toward me is both safety for you and you know, this is a prey animal and their number one instinct when something doesn't feel right is to move. And if I try to clamp them down and say, you cannot move, they're going to figure out a way to feel safe. And that safety may be, um, now I'm going to explode until I am free or, okay, you won't let me move. Well, I'm going to fight. I I can't have flight. Then I'll have fight. So I'm going to kick you or I'm going to bite you, get you away from me. And so that movement is so important to say, um, it's okay to move. I understand that you want to move. You're not in trouble. Um, but this is how you need to move to stay safe. And after a while, the horse is going to kind of go, well, you know, nothing bad has happened. And I've kind of been going around for a long time. I'm going to try standing still. And in the beginning of this exercise, they learn through condition response that standing still is the answer. Um, But they might just be putting up with you moving all over them like this. But by the end of this method, if you practice this enough, it actually becomes a sense of comfort for them. They're like, oh, I love this exercise because we just get to sit still and hang out and it's it feels really good and I get all my itchy spots scratched. So, you know, the more repetitive you are with this, the more it becomes a source of comfort, and which is very important when you go to put the first rides on. Um And so, you know, when you're doing this, so like I said, you're leaning on the horse, rubbing all over, leaning on the horse, rubbing all over, releasing every time the horse is still and relaxed. Um, And like I said, by release, I'll stop rubbing and I'll actually take a step back from a horse. And if maybe, maybe the first time I do this, the horse was quite sensitive to it and not sure. I may even stop and then walk several feet away from the horse, get to the end of my lead rope and just say, let's just sit for a second. Or maybe we'll go for a walk over here for a second and give a big release. Like, you, man, you got through that. I'm so proud of you. And then I'll go back in and do it again. So, 
you know, the next step that I want to do is I'm going to start rubbing on the horse, leaning on the horse, and then I'm going to start jumping up and down beside the horse because I'm going to have to get up over his back. And whether I'm using a mounting block or I'm doing this from the ground, that jumping is really important to get him to get used to you because if I get on from the ground, I will be giving a little jump to get up there. So I'll jump up and down and I, I have my hands on the horse while I'm doing this and I'll jump, jump, jump. And if a horse moves around, that's where it gets really fun because you have to keep jumping while the horse is moving. It's a really good exercise. <laughs> it's really good calorie burning um, and then at this point in the game, I'm going to jump, jump, jump. And the release actually becomes when the horse stands still and relaxes, I'm going to go back to rubbing gently. So that starts to become the release, jump, jump, jump. And then rubbing, you know, going back to standing still and rubbing them gently all over that becomes the release from them for them. So really there's a, there's an element of advance and retreat in that in the beginning, you, you incrementally get get closer and rub more sections and rub more vigorously and then it moves to jumping. And as you add an additional element, you use the previously learned comfortable elements as the release. Instead of you, you get to the point now that you're jumping next to them and they reply by saying, yeah, I'm cool with that. We can hang out here. The release is you stop jumping and go back to rubbing versus stepping completely away, you reserve that for the the bonus reward, the bonus release. Yes. And I still will like walk away from them if I feel like, man, you really just need to sit alone for a second and just mm -hmm. enjoy this. But yes. Um, so yeah, uh, the rubbing will actually become the release. Um, and so, yeah, you jump, 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 and then rub, 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 jump, 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 rub, rub, rub. That's that's a great setup for the horse right later in life because we use the rub on the neck or for some people the pat on the neck as a reward for their entire life. So it's really cool that you're setting themselves up to have that sense of relief, the endorphin release with the rub. That's really cool. Well, and it really comes into play, and I'll speak on this here in a little bit, uh, doing the first ride. It, I, it was one of my biggest aha moments in cult starting, um, but I'll get to that in just a moment because we have more on the curry comb part. And, you know, you still have a big jump, so to speak, from I'm kind of doing these little half jumps next to you, too. I'm going to get on your back. So what can I do to kind of bridge that gap? So then what I start doing is I'll jump, 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 and I'll kind of accidentally on purpose try to jump on the horse but not really make it all the way. So it's not really like a body slam because it's not meant to be uncomfortable or painful, but I'll kind of jump and like act like I'm, oh, I tried to get on and then slide off and then go back to rubbing immediately. So I go jump, 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 half jumps, try to get on, didn't quite make it slide off and rub, rub, rub. So I'm just kind of letting the horse, hey, you know, I'm letting them know something's coming and I want you to be prepared for what might happen next. Um, and again, you can do this from a mounting block or like a bucket is really good to do it from because you can carry the bucket around with you if the horse moves. And it really doesn't take them that long to get used to the element of the bucket. Um, so then I'll, I'll just do these little half jumps over and over and over again. And then one of these times I jump, I'm just going to jump on. And by jump on, I don't mean swing a leg over. I mean, I jump on and I jump forward and lay myself across the horse. So I'm kind of horizontal across the horse. So my legs are on one side, my shoulders are on the other side of the horse. And that is the first time like that horse has weight over his back. Now, what's really important here is don't jump on and then go completely still because you've just done something huge. And if you sit really still, your horse is going to go, wait, what are you doing? So once I'm on, I keep moving my hands. I'm like, rub, 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 rub. If the horse decides to move at this point, the important thing you need to do is keep his nose tilted in the direction that you were on. So if I'm working on the left side of the horse doing this and I hop on and I'm hanging over his back like that, and you want to get like your weight equally over so you're not hanging off to one side. I'm going to um, stop you right here. If you haven't ever done this before, practice on a horse that's already broke. 
so that you learn to jump over, lay on your belly button while a horse moves, because it sounds easy, but it's not. And it's actually, (laughs) this is good for any horse. If you've got a horse that's broken, does all this stuff, but maybe they're just a little kind of sensitive and nervous. This is a great, every horse can benefit from this. It's great exercise for the human too. Exactly. It's a great core workout. Yeah. Yeah. So if they try to move with me up there, I'm going to try to stay on. And how I'm going to stay on safely is I keep, so if I was working on the left side doing this, and I'm staying on one side at a time going through this whole thing, I'll get to the other side later. But so we're on the left side doing this. So if I hang over him and he's like, "Mm, I don't know about this, I'm going to tip his nose to the left. And if he's just walking around in a small circle, I'm going to hang out there with him and just keep rubbing him and loving on him. Now, sometimes, you know, my balance get shifted and I need to hop off or sometimes the horse kind of goes a little quickly forward. So all I do is I hop off, land on my feet, tip their nose toward me, and then I go right back in there and start again. He's not in trouble. I'm not going to make him feel uncomfortable, but I'm not going to stop either until I can jump, 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 hop halfway on, rub on him, rub on him, rub on him, and he stands still. And You can do all this whole process in a day or you can take several days. Maybe that's as far as you get today. Totally fine. Um, And so the, the safety element of this, how you make this work is you don't want to straddle this horse for this exercise. Some people do. I would say if you're just starting out, don't. So, you know, if, if he moves, even if he jumps forward, you are most likely going to land on your feet. Um, And that's what keeps you safe doing this. So um, once I can hop up on him halfway like that, or, you know, all the way like that, but I'm, you know, I'm just sort of hanging over his back and I can move my hands all up and down his neck. And you want to keep that rhythm going, jump, 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 hop up, rub, 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 rub while you're up there. And I can do that over and over and over. And he's totally okay. Well, the goal that I'm working to, um, to in this exercise is I want to be able to lay across his lay on his back on my belly. So I'd be facing his ears with um, my face is facing his ears and my back legs are kind of over his rump, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so in order to be able to swing my legs up in that manner, I need to give him a hint that that's coming because I don't want to just swing up there and he's never felt that before. So when I'm laying halfway over him, kind of like a sack of grain hanging on over his back, I'm going to start swinging my legs back and forth. And that's a new element he has to get used to. And again, if he moves, I'll try to stay on. I'll keep his nose tipped to the left so that he has to move in a small circle. But if I have to slide off, I'll slide off, land on my feet, and then just go right back at it again. Um, And I do this over and over and over again until I can hop on his back and swing my legs back and forth and back and forth. So he just gets used to that feeling. And then one of these times, I'm just going to swing on up. Again, keep your legs together. Don't straddle the horse. Um, and I'm going to, I'll be, I'm pretty much laying up in line with his spine. And again, once you're up there, don't sit still. I'm going to keep rub, 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 keep that rhythm going. And, um, that is usually about as far as I take it on each side. You can work to straddling them and sitting up and everything like that. But when you do that, if you decide, well, I'm just going to sit on them bareback, the risk there is. But say the horse gets tense, it can be really hard for us not to also tense up and wrap our legs around him. When that happens, he's gonna. There's a chance he'll feel claustrophobic, and that's where you can have leaping and bucking happen. So there's risk doing that. So I'd be very, I'd caution you to be very careful about that. But if you stay, if you take it to the point of I'm just gonna lay across his spine. If he moves at this point, he'll probably go forward and he's not going to jump in the air or anything like that. And if he if he moves forward and moves around, you just swing off the same side that you started on. That's very important. If I, if I got on on the left, I'm coming off on the left and land on your feet, tip his nose towards you. Um, and while you're up there, like laying across his spine, you can even work on pushing yourself back. And you do this a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further each time, and you can actually slide off of his rump. So in order to do that, um, 
each time I slide off, so I jump on the horse, lay across his back, and when I when I go to dismount, I'm going to slide off a little further back of him each time. So I'll slide off by his belly, and then I'll slide off by his hip, and then I'll slide off to one side of his tail. And um, I just do that until I've made it to where once I slide off his rump, it's no big deal. And I do that. I So I do that all on one side and then I switch sides. And just because I've done it on one side doesn't mean I can do it on the other side just the same. I start all over again, starting with rubbing, then little jumps, then little half jumps, then get on and so forth. Um, and it is a great exercise. It really, there's something about the way you do it where it is extreme close contact and rhythmic moving and you've got horse hair all over you by the end of it that is... Um, it's very calming to the horse. How neat. That's a great method. And I can, I can totally see how this works. It makes so much sense once you explain it. Yeah. And you can find, there's videos of people demonstrating it on YouTube. Um, I haven't found one that does Why it. Why isn't there a video of Mary demonstrating it? I, well, I look like a hippopotamus <laughs> doing it. But one of these days I'm going to have to make one because there's not a video of doing it quite the way I do it. Um, you need to add it to your repertoire. Exactly. Yeah, I need to I need to do that. Um, and, of course, I, I used to do it just completely from the ground because uh, my joints weren't uh, destroyed at that point. And now I, I totally use a bucket or mounting block. Um, and the cool thing about all of this is in the beginning, they're just kind of accepting that you're doing this. But after a while, they, they really take, they're like, oh, I love this. I love this exercise. And if you do this in the spring when they're a little itchy, it's probably an added benefit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And the good thing about this is by the time you are saddling them and you're ready to get them to accept the first ride, you have laid all over this horse and touched every square inch of him. So nothing is a surprise. And how this relates to the first ride, um, I learned kind of how to connect these two things together, actually starting Colts at Chris, Co uh, Chris Cox's ranch, who's an amazing trainer. He's run one road to the horse like, every time he's done it. And he doesn't do the curry comb part of getting on a bareback, but what he, he still implements that rhythmic rubbing that horse all over. So when he goes to get on the horse for the first time, he's doing it with the saddle with the intention of we're going to do the first ride. So he rubs the horse all over and then he does all of the preparation for mounting, you know, pull on the s saddle horn and jumping and all that kind of stuff, which is very similar to curry comb. And same thing, when he gets on that colt for the first ride, he doesn't swing a leg over and then just sit there or whip them in the butt and go, let's go. He gets on them and he rubs their neck with both hands and rubs that horse all over and rubs their butt and he he won't stop moving. He leans forward, rubs the neck, leans back, rubs them over their rump. And it's exactly like what they did on the ground. So the horse is like, oh, this is more of the same, but there's a little bit something else going on here. And when he gets that horse ready to take the first step, what he does is he tips that colt's nose to, to the side and gets that colt to yield their hindquarters one step. And as soon as that colt moves one step, instead of continuing to move or trying to pull the horse to the stop, he puts his hands forward and rubs that colt all over their neck. And that colt remembers from the previous exercises of, oh, when this person is rubbing me all over, we just stand still and relax. So the colt did something that was a little scary. They took a step and then it's rub, 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 rub. And then he'll tip their nose and take one step, two step, rub, 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 rub. Then one step, two step, three step, rub, 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 rub. So that cold is expecting to go back to this neutral being rubbed on. And he's not thinking so much of, wait, there's someone on my back. Oh, my God. And mm -hmm. you just do that to where you take three or four steps and you start walking forward and, you know, five and six steps, rub, rub, rub. And then the cool thing about how this all plays up, you do this through all three gates this first try. try you take a few trot steps, rub, rub, rub. A few canter steps, rub, rub, rub. And so you actually create this really cool stop cue on this horse. As soon as you relax your seat and you put your hands down, that colt stops perfectly. And it's so cool. You're not having to pull on this colt and make them stop. They just know that stopping is the default. And this is the happy place where we get love done. 
da 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 So you're covering so many bases with that process. Like you said, the horse is learning to be comfortable with the weight of your body and your body moving around physically and visually. And you're also creating aids from the first time you sit on their back. Exactly. And it creates just this beautiful, it looks like a finished stop on this horse. Yeah. Um, and well, it's his idea. You didn't, you didn't manhandle the horse into a stop. He just, he feels like, Oh, I better stop. This is going to be awesome. And whenever the horse, and I've, I've noticed this now doing particularly with Nigel, when I do any positive reinforcement training with him, or when I ask him to halt under saddle, because he is anticipating something he enjoys, when a horse is experiencing something they enjoy, they tend to activate their core and lift themselves up versus stopping and bracing against something. Mm-hmm. I get a halt that the horse is engaged at the halt without mm-hmm. ever touching any part of his body. I don't have to pick up the reins. I don't have to close my legs. I just give him that cue with my weight. And for me, in this case, it's a weight of putting the weight into my heel a little bit and engaging my core. He's anticipating getting a scratch on the neck or a cookie, or if I'm on the ground, he's anticipating getting a cookie. So he engages himself. He lifts his shoulders and he, his neck is craned down. He's going, Whoa, this is going to be good. So I get a fantastic halt without creating 101 minute bits of something with my body. It just happens. And it's really kind of cool. <laughs> It is. And it's, it goes into, I continually get surprised over the years working with horses of things that I used to think took a great amount of effort and repetition and drilling. It's like, oh no, this is what it takes to get a horse to stop in this way. And 101 times doing it wrong. (laughs) Yeah. And then all of a sudden you figure out how to do it with less and less and less. And then you're like, wait a minute. This is easy. This is the easiest thing in the world. I remember starting Colts when I first started learning how to do all this stuff of having to repeat the stop over and over because they just wouldn't stop on my cues and I'd try to relax and say the right words and do the right and and they just didn't get it. And I'm like, this horse is stubborn. And then I started learning methods like this. Make the stop the safe place. That's all the horse wants. They, where am I going to feel safe? That is their motivation. And if you show them like consistently, this is this is a good deal. This is where things feel good. They're going to crave that stop. They're like, I can't wait. I can't wait till she says that word. I can't wait till she relaxes her seat because then I'm going to relax too. And it's going to be so great. It's so important, not, not just to make the horse do something with a cue or with pressure or with tools or whatever, but to show them that when they do the thing, it's a good deal. Everything is great here. And to see the change with this curry comb ep- uh, exercise, to see the horse in the beginning, just allowing you to touch them and stuff like that. And you can see them just, you could see their brain going, I'm not okay with this, but I know this is what I'm supposed to do. And then the the change happens to where they crave it. They can't wait till we get to just, let's sit still together and, you know, and this is going to feel good. And that's where you see the horse looking the way the horse is meant to, relaxed, but still engaged and alert. Yeah. Yes. With this beautiful top line and not the tenseness that you see sometimes when this happens. There we go. Well, we're going to take another quick break. And this time we're going to hear from the fine folks at Daily Dose Equine. And when we come back, we're going to do a quick new Mustang update. Daily Dose Equine offers a full line of handcrafted horse feeds to maximize the health and performance of horses and ponies of all ages. Each custom feed has been developed with whole grains and non-GMO ingredients to eliminate the risk of herbicide contamination. They are horse people themselves, and they have seen firsthand the difference that superior nutrition can have in our equine partners. We invite you to learn more about Daily Dose Equine's origins and to find a formula that is perfect for your horse. Go to DailyDoseEquine.com. That's DailyDoseEquine.com. So what's this I hear about? Is How does Remy feel about a new Mustang coming into the clan? How does he feel about that? He's okay with it. He, You know, as long as he gets his uh, two square meals a day and <laughs> as much hay and grass as he can eat, he doesn't care. Um, and this is not a new permanent Mustang. This is a Mustang for the Mustang Magic Competition, which is coming up in January. So what's the difference between Mustang Magic and Extreme Mustang Makeover? 
So it's held at the same venue and it runs like a traditional Mustang makeover where trainers get, um, I think it's four months to train a horse and then go to Fort Worth and show and all of that stuff. Uh, this one is invitation only. So they invite, um, some really talented trainers from across the country, usually people who've done well in makeovers before, um, or, you know, have accomplished something in some way with Mustangs. And, uh, so it's really fun. It's really, uh, it's a great event to go to and it takes place during the Fort Worth stock show. So there's a ton of other stuff going on. So this is within another show. Okay. is it is so you have the stock show with people showing all sorts of different livestock and and there's rodeos and concerts but then there's also the mustang magic competition so there's lots to do a uh, lots to see and um yeah as i was pulling out of the fort worth coliseum this morning to um come do the show i saw the truck full of the mustang magic horses pulling in and i was like oh, i have to see them so we actually get our horses picked tonight oh so they um, ship them into fort worth and you pick them from a herd a little bit like they do with re- with the um the the um rtth Road no. to the horse. Road to the horse. Thank you. That, a little <laughs> similar. They put a Ramuda, a little herd out there. So do the horses that you get to choose from, they they obviously come from one of the local Texas herds, I would think. There are, I don't know if there are any BLM Mustangs in Texas. Um, word on the street is these oh, horses. One of the Western herd. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these horses are likely from Nevada. Um, that's just what I've heard. I don't know officially where they're from, but the, yeah, they're probably in one of the herds out West. Um, how this works when horses are gathered is the horses are gathered and then taken to several different facilities um, where they get processed. And if it's a stallion, it's gelded and, and, you know, they'd get taken care of and vaccinated, dewormed, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then they go to several facilities all over the country and are either, um, you know, they'll stay in holding or they'll go to adoptions or they'll get used for events like the Mustang makeover. So, um, I believe these are Nevada Mustangs. I, I'm not sure. I won't know till this afternoon. Um, so what 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 are you going to look for when they're offloaded and they're put out into the arena or into a pen for you to look at? What are some of the things that you're going to look for in your Mustang Magic pupil? So um, it's always a toss up because you can get so many ideas about a horse and then take it home and realize, oh, this is quite different. <laughs> I've had that happen. Oh my gosh. I had one that was so gentle and sweet looking in the pens. And then when he went into the chute to get loaded, I have never been more fearful of a horse coming out of the chute and running across the streets of Fort Worth as I was with this horse. Oh my and gosh. He was extremely wild. Oh my, he was the most wild horse I've ever seen in person. Wow. Um, so there's always a toss up, but things that I look for, um, I look for how they are in the pen with the other horses. Um, you know, are they quiet? If something, if there's a noise, do they, are they the first one to shoot their head up and run around like crazy? Are they aggressive with the other horses? So I'll look for personality. There are some that come to these pens that they are wild untouched horses, but they'll walk right up to you in the pen and they kind of look, look at you like, Hey, are you my new person? Do you have food? Um, Remy was that way. Remy just, he just wanted to know where the food was coming from. So <laughs> You know, I can find another one of those. I look for, um, you know, pretty decent confirmation. That's not extremely high on the list for me. You know, I want them to be, you know, fairly well put together and balanced. But I've had horses that I didn't think were going to be able to do anything. But because they had so much heart, um, just did things you wouldn't believe. Uh, So that's not extremely high on the list. Um, uh, the other things that I look for, I've I've gotten to be a little bit, I don't think I'd call it superstition or anything, but f- uh, face shape is very important to me. Um, there are things I look for in the way a horse's face is put together that fairly reliably tell me how a horse is going to end up. Interesting. Um, well, actually, the funny thing about the horse that I mentioned that was like the most wild horse I've ever seen. One of the staff at the makeover, 
he said, which horse did you get? And I showed him, I went to the pen. I'm like that one there. And he looked at the horse and looked at me and he goes, tell me how that one starts. I just want to know. And I'm like, wait, what, what do you know? (laughs) What was this horse? Was he doing backflips earlier? And he wouldn't tell me. He just said, tell me, tell me how that one goes. Nothing like being cryptic. Yeah. And I told him afterwards, I said, that horse was wild. Um, I actually ended up taking him back and for him to go in long-term holding, which is uh, large amounts of public land up in the Oklahoma, Kansas area. And I said, he just needs to be on a hill living his life and looking pretty because he's, he's a lot of horse. Um, so I told the staff member, I'm like, you know, this is what happened. The horse was really, really wild. I said, what did you know? And he said, well, he said the distance between his ears and his eyes were really short. And this guy, this staff member uh, was a cowboy. He has started hundreds of horses and he's seen every different kind of horse there is. And he says, as a general rule, when I see one like that, they end up being pretty, pretty tough. And I was like, wow, okay. So there's a lot of things I look for. There's no scientific reason behind what I'm looking for. It's just your own um, experience, yeah. It, it is. And it's fairly reliable. You know, I look for their, I, I like big, you know, big eyes that aren't really deep set in their head. Um, uh, you know, good whorls, uh, there are things like that. And like I said, if I really am attached to a horse, but something about their face shape or whorl or whatever, uh, is, is, you know, kind of not on one of my boxes that I like to check, I will still get that horse. I, but if I'm not sure about a horse and they've got something about them that I'm like, "Mm, I'm not sure, then I will pass. If that makes any sense. Yeah. It's, it's a very, it's hard to put into words what makes a person pick a particular horse under any circumstances. It's, it's, I almost say, well, he has a good aura. Because it's it's that scientific. <laughs> Sometimes it is gut instinct. Yeah. It's just gut instinct. That's very interesting. Do you know how many you will have to choose from? I don't at this point. And I don't even know how many trainers are in the makeover. And how it works is this afternoon, um, we will each draw a number. And like, if you draw number one, that means you get to pick first. Mm -hmm. So if you're the unlucky person who draws like number 30, you probably get whatever is in the pen. (laughs) So that's a bit nerve wracking. Um, I'm sure sure they'll probably have more than the trainers just so that. Yes. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So whenever you do these, when you get to pick out, do they, is it a mixed herd or is it all geldings? They try to keep them as similar as possible. Usually it will be all mares and all geldings, but they try to keep like the ages similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, they'll try to keep the ages relatively similar and, um, you know, just so we have as kind of even a pool as you can have with these types of competitions. Interesting. So, So That'll happen. So by the time we do our next show, you will have your new Mustang and we'll get to hear all about them. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, stay tuned, everybody. <laughs> Fun times. Yeah, I'm so a glutton to wrap for things punishment. Up, one more time, where can everybody keep track of your antics this week? Uh, I will be posting some updates on my Facebook page, which is Mary Kitzmiller Horsemanship. And if they want to follow you, uh, hire you for a clinic, help have them help you train a horse, which you can do remotely now because you do them via some kind of something uh where do they contact you also through my facebook page you can shoot me a message um or you can find me on my personal page which is just mary k kitzmiller um and my email is also on my website which is mary kitzmiller.com thank you very much well you have a great day head on back over there to the fort worth and have one of those really good hamburgers i had one when i was there it was amazing Oh, oh, yeah. There's And there's so many good restaurants around here. I'm so excited. It's bad. You'll have to do extra jumping exercises with the horses. Yes, yes. I'll need <laughs> to maybe run some laps around the, around the facilities. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a bunch. We'll see ya. All right. See ya. 